Okay, uh, dear colleagues and friends, I, I think it's uh, time to start uh, our panel, Eastern Dimension of EU Actiness. Uh, my name is uh, Ilkka Liikanen. I'm from the University of Eastern Finland and I'm chairing uh, the panel. Uh, the panel is based on a work of a research project called The Northern Dimension of uh, EU Actiness, uh, which is funded by the, the CONEF Foundation and carried out by uh, researchers from the University of Eastern Finland. And, and uh, Russian Academy of, of Science, uh, Moscow. Uh, today we are joined by uh, scholars from uh, other Eastern Central European uh, countries and, and broadening the, the scope of, of discussion. Uh, in the first, we have two panels, uh, or two sessions in, in this panel. The other one is, uh, is starting five o'clock in, in Hörsal, uh, Film 10, 15, Lecture Hall 15. And um, mm, we have uh, three uh, presentations in this uh, first uh, session. One paper is left out, the, the, the last one in the, in the program. So we have a bit uh, more time, but about 20 minutes uh, each speaker. And we have a uh, commentator, Victor Conrad from University. Carlton University, Ottawa. Uh, so five minutes maybe for, for Victor. And um, the uh, basic uh, starting points of, of the uh, project and, and the panel are, are related to this concept of actorness, with which we want to take uh, distance from maybe particular fixed notions of the role, international role of, of EU as an, as an actor. Also in the study of uh, border studies, we are, uh, it's, it's rather common to refer to, to the EU as a special new kind of international actor representing new uh, notions of sovereignty, borders, uh, territoriality. And, uh, well, sometimes uh, contrasting Russia to this as an old kind of international actor fixed on uh, spheres of inter interests and, and buffer zones and, and, and so on. So we, we want to study uh, these roles of, uh, of the major players, but looking at it from uh, different uh, layers uh, European, national, uh, regional, in a way, actors' perspective, and, and, and this, uh, through this, uh, contribute and to broader discussion of, of, of the international roles of, of EU and, and Russia. And without further ado, I, I uh, invite the first speaker, Professor James Scott, from the University of uh, Eastern Finland. And uh, please, James, the floor is yours. So, hi there, everybody. I'm going to start off this, uh, these two sessions with uh, kind of a general presentation that is, uh, you could say, is way, in a way cumulative because it summarizes some of my own personal observations about the EU as a political actor, as an internationally uh, effective or not effective political actor, uh, particularly with relation to this um, uh, policy called the neighborhood policy, which has been in place around, uh, well, 15 years, since 2003, 2004, originally known as the, the, uh, the wider Europe initiative, but then was refashioned into a complex neighborhood policy. Um, and the, the main reason for developing this, this, uh, this initiative come policy was to give the European uh, Union's uh, uh, common foreign and security policy an actual structural existence, 
and also to uh, improve the, uh, the, the, the prospects for cooperation with third states that uh, were somehow left on the margins in the, at that borderline between EU membership and aspiration to EU membership. So those states that uh, after, two th after the big bang enlargement uh, 2000, uh, in, the, in, in the 2000s um, were kind of left at the what seemed to be some uh, semi-permanent borders of the European Union. And they haven't really changed uh, that much since, uh, uh, since the last, the, the 2004, 2007. Um, yeah, and the question is to what extent is the neighborhood policy still viable? I mean, that's a very legitimate question given the present geopolitical uh, mess we seem to be in, and also the uh, internal political mess, says crises that the EU is, is, uh, is, is, is dealing with. So to what extent can we actu actually speak of, a, of EU actorness in the sense of a effective, uh, 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 an ability to act with some efficiency, with some, um, uh, with some uh, impactfulness, so to speak, uh, on the world scene. Is the EU actually in, 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 in uh, the position to realize its dream of being a force for good in the world and uh, being a stabilizing political actor in terms of a wider understanding of security, a human global security? So I'll start off by saying that uh, Answering this question is not easy because it also depends what the, what, from what perspective you're looking at the EU and its actorness. Um, and it also depends on what, what discipline you come from. Whether you're a critical geopo uh, a geopolitics scholar, a p political geographer, somebody who's really embedded in IR, even if it's critical IR, or people who look at it from a more cultural, um, uh, a social uh, uh, um, perspective. Um, what I'm going to try to do is, is basically summarize some of the uh, arguments that I have developed as a geographer uh, and uh, thinking in terms of critical geography, uh, trying to find a way of, of, of interpreting the European Union as a, as a political actor. How to interpret it? Um, number one problem that we face is that the EU is not your traditional uh, political actor uh, or security actor. It does not have an army, so to speak, uh, at, it, that, that at its beck and call in order to uh, uh, forcefully um, uh, act in, in different regions of the world. It might have peacekeeping missions which are uh, built up by member states, made up by uh, soldiers from member states in cooperation with, with the United Nations uh, forces, but itself does not have anything like a standing army, nor does it want one in that sense at least uh, in my understanding of the European Union. Uh, the, uh, the EU's uh, political identity is more of a soft power actor that acts through uh, uh, non-violent means um, in, in the best of cases. Um, so that also means, however, that the EU does not have an unambiguous interest-based geopolitical identity. If we go back to realist understandings of the international system, states, can define national interests and thus can define a clear geopolitical strategy. The EU has a problem that it cannot define a clearly um, nationally uh, uh, defined set of, of interests. It has to develop a more values-based kind of approach to geopolitics, which is also rather unorthodox. Um, the EU itself is a hybrid composite polity. Um, it's, uh, it has an executive, it has a legislative, it has the member states, but it's not really a functioning super state as some people were, were thinking it might, might, might become maybe at the millennium, if, uh, this federal super state of the EU. It's not there yet and who knows if it will, ever will come to be. Um, so here again, it does not have that coherence or that kind of a political uh, uh, um, cohesion that a uh, traditional nation state uh, enjoys. Um, can the EU provide new geopolitical models of action that are based on multilateralism, uh, oh, uh, uh, sorry about that, a, a typo, and sustainability? Um, and particularly if the pseudo, what I would call the pseudo-realism of zero-sum zero geopolitics seems to be striving for hegemony. Nobody seems interested in interdependence anymore or, or facing up to the reality of interdependence. It's all about independence. 
and, um, and, and, and uh, multilateralism is being attacked by all sides, uh, and not, not the least by a, a specific general, gentleman who was now in Brussels with NATO telling everybody that they should, well, please go to hell and let America be great again. But I'm not going to digress on that. I'm just saying that the overall context for the development of, of EU actorness is a, at this point in time is a very complex one. Um, so to go, uh, let's say, a bit further in these arguments <clears throat> about the EU, um, and it really is about the quandaries the European Union finds itself in, in order to develop this, this project of, of neighborhood, which has been suffering a number of setbacks. And of course, um, the Ukraine, uh, the annexation of the Ukraine, and the, uh, the, uh, the aggressions in, in eastern Ukraine um, have not torpedoed, for example, the Eastern Partnership, which is a part of the, the neighborhood policy altogether, but has, let's say, dampened expectations of what the EU can achieve east of its borders. And the question is, does it even have a geopolitical role? Before I get to that question, um, a more general one is that the EU itself is also kind of a contradictory political body, because it embodies it, it, basically the dilemma of liberalism. Liberalism is not a religion. It, is not a, it, it has not reached that state of purity and, and nirvana uh, that it, it, it is true, absolutely true to its values. It is basically a typical modern liberal democracy defined by transcendental principles, but often guided by opportunism and painfully aware of its own contradictions. And we see this, uh, uh, I think, uh, in, in very stark form at the EU's external borders with, 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 with uh, the inability to deal with migration and asylum. Um, so EU is conditioned by a constant tension between uh, an attempt to make dis borders kind of not matter not disappear, let's say, but not matter in, in interstate, intercommunal relations, uh, and that's under, overcome national particularisms. <clears throat> but at the same time, the EU needs to also give the impression that it's contributing to a sense of national local control, that the EU is actually pa a partner in a multi-level uh, uh, um, multi practice of securitizing the European Union in, in terms of making uh, people think that we live in a, in, in a, in a more or less uh, a stable, uh, prosperous union. Uh, and then the populist challenge that the EU is facing, which really is about borders and national identities, is challenging this, 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 this very complex balance between spiritualizing and, then, and, and, and securitizing borders. For example, constant attempts for, from Hungary, Poland, other right-wing groups, Eurosceptics, to downsize and downscale the European Union um, uh, and to prevent, let's say, the emergence of a new empire. I mean, this is Orban Victor's, you know, we don't need a new Moscow, a new empire. We already experienced that in the, in, in, in the socialist period. What we need is a national European Union, an, an EU made of nations, sovereign nation states that protect their borders. This kind of thinking, this kind of political discourse, of course, frustrates also greater international activism. And this is also the, tr uh, the case with, with, with the Ukraine. Um, so the future of the EU is an international actor. Here I might be, excuse me if I might be uh, repeating what I've said, um, but we can in, in, it's identify certain things that identify the EU in terms of its geopolitical identity. Um, I think it's unequivocally a supporter of the international system, and that's just why it wants to work with the United Nations, United Nations organizations, and other institutions, uh, even civil society organizations that, that operate at a more global level, um, developing uh, agreements, uh, uh, conventions, uh, uh, mechanisms to improve the, the pros prospects for global governance in different areas. And this is not just about security, in the traditional sense, it's also about health, development, uh, in the environment, etc. It's a new regionalist promoter of multilateralism, cooperation, and transboundary governance practices. And it's it, it, pragmatic, idealistic liberalism rather than realism. Um, however, uh, this kind of ambitious Identity is challenged by, and here again I'm repeating myself, the, the actual security and, and international cooperation context. Let me just mention, and I think Ilka mentioned this at the beginning, that we are also 
looking at this in, in concrete uh, uh, context of uh, EU-Russian and EU-Eastern partnership relations uh, in, with, with uh, projects that are funded by the um, Academy of Finland, the Kona Foundation, and the European uh, Union. So what can we say? I mean, now let me jump to kind of some, some uh, assessments, having spent maybe too much time in kind of conceptualizing the EU as a political actor and the context, the difficult context within which it's operating. What can we say about the Eastern neighborhood? And the reason why I'm now structuring my talk this way is I'm just basically trying to say that the EU should not lose its nerve. It not, it, it, the situation is not totally lost in the Eastern partnership. I'm not talking about the Southern Mediterranean dialogue right now because that's a very different regional context, bilateral context, although it definitely does impact on the overall situation. But here my focus is really much more on, on the, 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 the Eastern com component of, of what the EU is trying to do in terms of regional stability. Um, and in fact, the EU's external border is both softening and hardening be, uh, based on the ability to have, to, to, to take part in visa mobility partnerships and visas to come in to the European Union. Um, but this does not seem to have uh, really affected too much uh, the relations with uh, Eastern partners. And interestingly enough, one of the major thrusts of the EU's cooperation uh, policies until, well, until very recently, border management, border cooperation has been received quite well, in fact, in Moldova, Ukraine, partly in Belarus. Um, and in efficient border management, you could say, is more or less in place at these borders, and they function quite well. Um, and they actually, actually, they function quite well with, with, Russia's, uh, with Russia, uh, but that's maybe perhaps another, an, an, another issue. The European Union has been instrumental in creating border management structures, and these have been seen in those countries as supporting national integrity and national sovereignty. Uh, so Ukrainian uh, officials are basically saying, well, the EU is great because it really has helped create a sense of Ukrainian national sovereignty by helping us develop the, 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 um, the, the structures, uh, the, the actual institutional structures for, for, for governing our borders. And then also in, in terms of the Transnistria issue, very instrumental, the Bomoluk, the, the Frontex uh, um, uh, mission there to, uh, to create a, a, a kind of a quasi-border control mechanism in a, in a non, non, in non, de facto or de jure non-existing border. So um, the EU has been, I would say, rather successful in, in terms of uh, developing institutional relationships with, with these countries. Greater access has, to the EU has been granted to Eastern Partnership citizens who are able to more openly partake of the opportunities the, the, the uh, EU offers. Admittedly, migration, which was kind of an issue around 2010-11 with readmission agreements and, and, re, and, 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 and um, uh, placement centers for, for migrants trying to get into the EU, is not the problem there at that part of the EU's external borders. This is, of course, a much more different story at the, in the Mediterranean. Um, migration issues are not the problem. It's rather geopolitical tensions that, 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 are, that are fraying. And the uh, EU's uh, I I interaction with these, with, with these countries is not limited to border management. I, I hope not to have, have given you the false impression, but it's been a very multi-layered kind of involvement, um, perhaps not uh, sufficiently uh, embedded in, in the actual societies, but it has been dealing not only with things like border management, but also women's rights, uh, human rights, uh, 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 the rule of law, um, et cetera. The, the biggest geopolitical concern in this part of the world is clearly the EU's relations with Russia and the fact that, and this is something that might, probably will come out in greater detail in, in other discussions, and I won't go into the, how the EU-Russia partnership went astray, and I think there are, uh, uh, the EU has a lot of blame in this. Uh, what initially was not intended to be a geopolitical competition is in fact turned out to be at least perceived to be a zero-sum geopolitical game between the EU and the Russian Federation so that um, instead of this notion of having a neighborhood that is a, a place where human uh, global security can be can be realized it has become the um, understood as the place where the EU is trying to develop a zone of influence in traditional geopolitical terms, a kind of a sphere of influence, which is, of course, 
uh, competing against the Eurasian sphere of influence, which would be then that, that attributed to, to, to uh, the Russian Federation. So this notion that we have this confrontation of Russian great powerness versus EU's multilateral actorness. And we very soon also see that we have in, in, in the, within the context of this geopolitical contestation, ideological and uh, social areas of con con contestation with liberal, illiberal values uh, uh, being uh, uh, narrated as actually bordering mechanisms between, you know, kind of the weak liberal West and the strong, you know, more traditional conservative Orthodox East. Um, and uh, I would uh, argue that unfortunately the EU has, uh, despite its successes in the EU Eastern Partnership, has got itself in, into this trap so that it basically is interpreted in several places as being a, trying to be a traditional geopolitical actor. Um, and in fact, it, uh, uh, but the interesting thing is if we look at the EU's influence in countries like uh, Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia, or, or, or Moldova, uh, the influence in, in social economic terms is very strong, but it's less so politically. Um, potentially very, uh, very strong political and social uh, uh, role to play, but at this, it, at, at this point in time, its political influence is not that strong. Um, Good. I'm going to... Okay, so other issues with, with the neighborhood that I see as being a problem and that have maybe have contributed to this geopolitical, the, the, this creation of the geopolitical comp the perception of geopolitical competition is that the EU is perhaps a bit too elitist in its, uh, in its practices, in its, uh, in its neighborhood policies. Um, it, uh, it, it seems to want to own the, EU, the neighborhood and determine the conditions by which uh, people can be part of it, or countries can be part of it through conditionality. Um, and it's too, too, too closely associated with the EU's identity, perhaps, to fulfill the more ambitious goals that the EU has uh, uh, defined for it. It has a rather elitist status approach in dealing with uh, par partnership or neighboring states, um, where, which, and this is particularly the case in the Mediterranean, but it's also the situation in Eastern Partnership, where the, the, the EU it tries to directly uh, interact with, with, with po political elites, uh, parties, uh, and neglects grassroots uh, civil society organizations that are the ones who are really pushing uh, community agendas of, uh, of social development. Um, they think that they'll get more bang for the buck if they deal with, for example, NGOs that are well-developed and well-connected to the EU and at the same time well-connected to local political elites. Uh, they, can, they know that money will be used in, 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 in a good way if they put their money on these groups rather than taking, taking the, the risk of, uh, of, of uh, working with less well-organized but more, let's say, represent, representative groups working at the grassroots level. Um, also, the fact that there's very highly selective politics of visibility in terms of the neighborhood, who's, who is important, who is not. But I'm not going to get into the details of this because time is running out. Um, so, in the result is, in public perceptions and in critic analysis, the ENP is often reduced to an expression of geopolitics, a securitization, a securitization policy, and of course it's extraterritorial board regime become somehow the things that stick out rather than the other agendas that the ENP is actually trying to uh, further. Um, and this is where I would say the EU should not lose its nerve. It should, it should try to develop the EU ENP, but it has to kind of focus on the ENP in different ways. Uh, a need for a reflective pragmatism rather than geopolitical grand narratives maintaining cooperation and dialogue through social engagement and understanding the neighborhood as, a, as kind of a, an arena of interaction rather than just a policy and rather than just some kind of a policy framework where bureaucrats can tick boxes as they satisfy specific uh, demands. And a need to depoliticize neighbor neighborhood relations. It's more than a policy, it's a con context for interaction, communication, exchange. And the EU should see itself as a neighbor itself. It is a neighbor. It's not a unilateral region maker. Um, so it should not be seen as an explicit sphere of influence, uh, but a symmetry between the EU and other regional partners, of course, is an issue that cannot be just talked, to, talked, to, talked out of existence. Um, 
I argue that an alternative perspective uh, could be based on political, functional, cultural, and everyday relationships, like migration, but this conversation seems to be almost impossible given the present uh, uh, paranoia about migration and asylum seekers, could be based on these complex relationships and would engage and involve society. It could be values-based values -based while responsive to social development needs. And this is where I would see the, par the partnership actually having its, most, its greatest impact. Um, finally, and this is perhaps uh, future wishful thinking, well, whether the slow motion demise of the nation state will make a greater EU global role inevitable. Good question. It's also a question whether the EU will survive the demise of whatever is uh, facing us in the next few years. Okay, that was just a, a, a short introduction to the, to the neighborhood context, and I, and I hope that was more or less understandable. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, James, uh, and I welcome our next uh, speaker, Alexander Duleba from the University of Brazil. Please. Okay. Oh, it doesn't work? I don't know. Um, uh, dear Professor Likan and Professor Scott, uh, distinguished participants, it's really my big privilege to speak at this very interesting panel and to add maybe some uh, insights from the research we're doing within the uh, University of Presho, actually. Uh, so I, I'm going to speak about the potential limits of Ukraine's association with the European Union. And actually within the research, we did a comparative analysis of the contractual frameworks for the EU relations with the third countries, uh, which are based on two, I mean, on uh, economic integration, but no political membership. And so uh, then, uh, uh, so we are doing this uh, research within the project this is a brief information of the project, impact of the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement on the Slovak-Ukrainian cross-border cooperation. And I'm really very happy that uh, I can speak uh, at the panel with colleagues from the uh, University of Eastern Finland, because actually we uh, uh, apply the methodology you invented and applied during this ex linear project in order to get comparative uh, research outcomes with uh, the other sections of the EU external border and uh, especially conditions for the cross-border cooperation. So what I'm doing within the research, uh, within this research project is that actually uh, I'm analyzing the supranational level EU-Ukraine relations as a framework for the cross-border cooperation. Uh, so uh, very briefly about the uh, methodology. Uh, I think I will not uh, repeat what, was already, uh, what has been already said by Professor Scott when it comes to the characterization of the EU as an as a international actor. I would like to mention that actually, uh, so uh, the research is based on the conceptualization of, the, of international actors of the EU, but also on the uh, conceptualization when it comes to the differentiated integration, and also the extended and externalized governance of the EU. And actually what I will present here, I mean this comparative analysis is based on two main indicators elaborated by Sandra, Sandra Lavanex. Uh, uh, the first is a range of harmonization because actually uh, the contracts which I will, I mean uh, which uh, we do research and um, uh, try to compare is first the EEA countries, I mean the contractual framework between the European Union, Nor Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein, the European Economic Area Agreements. Then the Turkish Customs Union, you know that since uh, 1995, Turkey uh, has this Ankara Agreement, which means that it selected uh, sort of the commodities and products, Turkey is a part of the European single market. And then uh, uh, we also took the European Association Agreements uh, which former 
uh, I mean, the Visegrad countries, the former Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Hungary signed it in 1992. Then the stabilization and association agreements signed it between the European Union and the Western Balkan countries. And uh, uh, so this is the uh, and Swiss model because Swiss has, Switzerland has very specific relationship with the European Union. They do not have one contract, but actually all, more than 120 bilateral contracts with the European Union. This is a very specific case. So, and Sandra Lavanex, she is the uh, top Swiss expert, and uh, she does a lot of research on this uh, Swiss model of relations with the European Union. So. Actually, those two main indicators so we applied, and I will present the outcomes of that. But I have some maps before I will go to the, this comparative table with the research uh, sort of the outcomes. And still, let me elaborate briefly on the EU actorness. You know the expression that the EU doesn't have a foreign policy, and the EU's foreign policy is its enlargement. And in my understanding and reading of the last four, almost four decades of the history of the European Union and its enlargement, I think that the critical momentum uh, came in the late 70s and 80s by accepting when the EU decided the European communities at that time to accept relatively undeveloped economic countries with very fresh memory of the authoritarian regimes. I mean the Southern Europe. This was acceptance of Greece, Spain, and Portugal. And if you just will look at this map, and if we will just come back to the uh, 70s, you would see that actually the Southern Europe was countries with the authoritarian military junta regimes, relatively less economically developed than the Western European countries. Central East Europe, communist countries, okay? And now we have this momentum when there was a decision to accept Greece, the EU started to change itself from inside. Structural funds, cohesion policy was developed within the European Union after the acceptance of Greece. It was not a sort of the matter of the intra European communities, you know, debate before the acceptance of relatively poor countries into the, into the club. And then the EU started to develop its model of enlargement policy, which we have, and which was applied later on uh, Central East European countries, former communist countries, but also it delivered a lot in the Western Balkans because actually stabilization and accession agreements, you know, the question is who, the, who helped to establish a peace in the Western Balkans. Was it NATO, United States, China, Russia? No, it was the EU. If we speak about the European Union enlargement policy and foreign policy, we speak about European integration project per se. This is about the future of the European integration project. Therefore, for me, the question sounds, if it will not work in case of Ukraine, then the question sounds whether we are really like, you know, sort of ending some cycle of the successful enlargement policy of the European Union over the last almost four decades, which will dramatically change the EU from inside. The EU doesn't have just external policies. Externalizations of the EU policies, so they're directly connected with the, with the, the sort of the internal structures of the European Union. We did a research, 2007-2009, uh, uh, the decisions, uh, so we looked at how uh, within the Foreign Affairs Council, where at the ministerial level, how the decisions are done, and actually we looked at the sort of the, you know, um, contested sort of the issues in external relations, and how the EU member states managed to get to find some consensus. And actually we found that it's really not easy to, there is no one political vision. Poland is not interested in Northern Africa. Portugal is not interested in Eastern Europe. And so you can find, identify the, uh, many cases like this, but we found that almost 80% when there was a consensus between the foreign affairs ministers of the EU member states, it was about the business deal. If we can manage to have a, 
contract, which will include export of the EU acquis communautaire, which will expand the single market, then the Portugal can support the Polish sort of the political vision or interest in Eastern Europe, and vice versa, Poland can support Portugal in, uh, you know, the interest when it comes to uh, Northern Africa, etc. And this is, you know, if you will just pick together the mosaics of the last 40 years, you will see that actually this is like, you know, machine on expansion of the single market. But the crucial, I think, if you want to understand the EU actorness, including in Eastern Europe, we have to understand, you know, this momentum with acceptance of Greece, Spain, and Portugal in the 80s, because this was the born of the sort of the present EU uh, or uh, as an international actor we have. And actually, you have the same schemes, the same sort of the models, you know, for the contracts and relations with the third countries. They're simply, you know, repeating, you know, uh, uh, the model invented in the 80s. So it's not about the end of the Cold War, but for the European integration project and the US actor in Europe, it's very important to understand how it changed before the single market uh, uh, 1989 was adopted and then uh, 1992 became, became a reality. And this is the map uh, which shows the single market. Okay, so you have this, including Switzerland, Norway, Island, you know, Liechtenstein, you have the Western Balkan countries, you have the Turkey with uh, 95 Ankara agreement, and now you have three, uh, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, three Eastern partnership countries with the association agreements with the DCFTA, Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Area, uh, parts of the association agreements. I interviewed, uh, it was, it happened, and it was 2009, 10, and 11, I interviewed the chief negotiator of the European Commission, uh, who was negotiating on behalf of the European Union, this DCFTA part uh, with Ukraine. I asked him, please tell me, what is the difference between EA agreement and Ukrainian association agreement with DCFTA? He said, you know, everything is there. It's almost, you know, sort of the copy-paste, you know, deal you know, took from the Norwegian sort of the agreement, it's also part of the Ukrainian, Moldova, and so it's, it's a specific story. And I asked him, okay, explain me, how much aki communitaire Ukrainians will need to absorb following this agreement? And in 2009, he said that 80%, it's estimate, when we met one year, you know, next year, he said it is 90%. And the third time, 95. So it's really 95% of acquis communitaire of the European Union. And if you can imagine, the EU produces, you know, per annum, around one, last year it was 1.5 thousand legal norms that regulate uh, the single market. And all those countries who have the access to the single market simply have to absorb this. Is it, I mean, all these agreements have a dynamic nature. It doesn't mean that the Ukrainians conclude in talks on the association agreement, you know, um, it was still, I mean, the Yanukovych government 2011, uh, that, but, you know, it's evolving target, it's, it's, it's changing. So you have to adopt new and new acquis following the sectoral agreements, I mean, you agreed with the European Union. So, uh, let me just, you know, you have different map of Eurozone, we have different map of the Schengen area, and this is very nice uh, map because 2004, this was the vision at the beginning of the Eastern, uh, I mean, European neighborhood policy, that the EU will open the single market to those countries who are, you know, uh, like on the map, including Russia, uh, Northern Africa, you know, the southern neighbors, eastern neighbors, as Prodi said, we will give you everything, but not institutions. This was the idea of the pan-EU project based on the model of the single market, which was developed and bought in the, you know, in the 80s as a model, 
so that we are very flexible. We want just more business. We can open our market. We can accept that. But you have to harmonize your business environment, economic conditions with the EU acquis communautaire. This is the conditions. You are not members, but you have to accept our laws. You know, this is very, very interesting position. Now, uh, I'm not going to elaborate in detail. So actually, uh, uh, this publication is uh, the first version of this study was already published, and it's available uh, uh, on the website, including this map, uh, uh, including this map um, uh, on the Slovak Foreign Policy Association. So I, in addition to my capacities, I work for the University of Prešov. I'm also the director of the Slovak Foreign Policy Association. It's uh, www.sfpa.sk. Let me briefly conclude uh, what's the problem. Range of approximation. When it comes to the range, of, because you know, it was very intriguing for me to follow the some EU leaders saying, this is the most ambitious sort of the contractual deal we offer the third country is the exactly association agreement with Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia. For me, it was really very important to understand what it means. Ambitious, it's, you know, it's EU jargon, and EU officials can say nice words, you know, ambitious. Uh, but what I found that actually this 95% of EU trade and economic related are key. So following the uh, European economic uh, I'm sorry, European Association, uh, uh, European Association agreements from the 90s, I mean with Czechoslovakia, Poland and Hungary, and the present stabilization association agreements with the Bast Western Balkan countries, uh, which simply envisaged that former communist countries in Central Europe and now Western Balkan countries should absorb 100% of the acquis communautaire, Eastern Partnership agreements with Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia means 95. And this is an original finding because it is an estimate of the chief negotiator of the European Commission for who was negotiating the uh, trade deal with those three countries as a part of the association agreement. Then, if you look, uh, you know, uh, Ukraine's association agreement uh, is really more ambitious than EEA agreement of Nor Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, because actually Norwegians, they have uh, very important exemptions. Like uh, you can see exemptions, agriculture, fisheries, customs union, etc., etc. Uh, I'm not going now because I do not have time uh, into the details, but uh, when it comes to the range of the approximation, which Ukrainians, Moldovans, and Georgians sign it within this contract. This is the second uh, most ambitious, if you want, the agreement in the history of the enlargement policy of the European Union. When it comes to legal quality, there is a big difference because actually all those agreements have very specific sort of the uh, characteristics, like um, uh, the most strict regime is included in the EA agreements of Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein because there is a principle of legal homogeneity. That means that the Norwegians, they, they say sometimes this is a fax democracy. It's a, we do not use faxes like now, but that means that if the new acquis is adopted, Norwegians simply have to absorb 100% of the acquis communautaire. In case of Ukrainian association agreement, there is a difference because actually it's more similar to the Swiss model. And in Swiss, you have the model harmonization with flexibility. But as I uh, found, there's a difference between harmonization and approximation. If you harmonize, that means that you absorb 100% of the EU acquis. If you approximate to the EU acquis, that means that you adopt some laws, then European Commission uh, actually will agree, okay, saying fine, deal is done, Let's, it's not 100%. It would be interesting to go into details and to compare the same eco, uh, acquis communautaire transpond to the Norwegian law with Ukrainian law. So we hope that maybe the next research we will do will uh, be focused on that. Okay, uh, this is a very important issue, access to policy shaping. 
Because I think in the relations between two entities is a normal that if the EU wants the partner country to absorb its acquis communautaire, that even if there is a not political membership, somehow the windows should be open for the, those countries to participate in the policy shaping or legislative process. And this is a case for EA countries. Uh, Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, they have access to the comitology. I mean, comitology committees are established by the council, which represents the member states. And, you know, following the legislating process, you have the ordinary legislative procedure. I took this picture from the official the, the side of the European Parliament. Comitology committees are not there. And this is the first stage of the legislating process within the European Union because before the European Commission initiates new legislation, it should be approved by, on the expert level by the member states. And Norwegians, you know, and experts from Iceland, Liechtenstein, they have a right, including Turks, and including the eight bilateral agreements, also experts from Switzerland, to sit together with the EU member state experts and raising the arguments we are in favor, we are, we are against, okay? Nothing like that is possible or open for the association agreements for Ukraine, Moldova, okay, I will conclude, okay. The main finding, which I would say that actually what uh, is the main conclusion, is that we identified the largest structural asymmetry in the existing integrative contractual frameworks for the EU relations with the third countries. That means that there are, is a big gap between a range of approximation with the EU, Akikomunitar, which is really very high, at the same time, uh, uh, on the on one hand, and the level of institutional involvement of contracting country like Ukraine into policy shaping within the EU. So this is also very interesting finding how this model works since the 80s and where we are with the integrative contracts right now. And so this is maybe preliminary main finding we did when we compared all these contractual frameworks that in the accession agreements, you know, and the question is whether it will work. It, if it worked for 40 years, if it will work now with, under the association agreement. So this is a really big question. It's also about the actorness and capacities of the EU to remain the transformative power in Europe. If not, I do not want to think what, we, what is ahead of us. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alexander, for these important insights to EU-Ukraine relations. And I invite uh, our last uh, speaker, Joni Virkkunen from the University of Eastern Finland. Joni, please. Thank you. Right, um, thank you. Uh, and um, my perspective uh, today will be very different from the previous uh, talks. Um, I will go to the concept of the Northern Dimension uh, and I will be looking at it uh, from a local regional perspective. Uh, uh, and, um, and I think um, this will give uh, new perspectives on, on, on this, this uh, EU policy uh, that have been uh, studied uh, from uh, high political levels, uh, uh, usually. Um, I, I will give some basic uh, in information about the Northern Dimension. Um, some colleagues will be um, dealing with that in the next section as well, in a more historical perspective, so I will just uh, refer to that shortly. Um, uh, this is an ongoing project, uh, so uh, we are still doing the inf um, interviews. Um, if I look at the, I would say, official definition of, of the uh, Northern Dimension uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, uh, homepage, it says that the Northern Dimension is an instrument of cooperation between four equal partners, European Union, Russia, Norway, and Iceland. 
Geographically, the northern dimension covers northwest Russia, the Baltic Sea region, the European Arctic areas, including the Barents region. The northern dimension policy aims to strengthen uh, stability, well-being and sustainable development in the region by means of practical cooperation. In addition, the governments, universities, research institutes and business community also participate in the northern dimension. So, um, it is a very uh, complicated uh, uh, setting uh, for, for a policy. Um, uh, it is geographically very diverse. It doesn't really refer to a, a particular area. It refers to uh, a number of um, uh, regional uh, committees that can be included uh, in the region. Uh, and also, um, of, co uh, of course, it has um, uh, the practical uh, goals that the, the, the neighborhood uh, policy has, uh, states as well uh, to strengthen uh, stability, well-being, and sustainable development in these regions. It does not have any uh, uh, financial instrument itself. Uh, it's it's uh, as a con wider concept. It's not institutionalized. Uh, it has had uh, strategy, action plans, um, but then it's. Uh, functions mainly through uh, partnerships that are very, very different for uh, partnerships. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, it relies on existing funding and inst instruments, uh, and uh, um, geographically it's very fuzzy. Um, it was launched in, in the late uh, 1990s uh, and renewed uh, after uh, uh, this uh, uh, worsening um, political situation with, uh, with the Russian Federation in uh, 19, 2006. First it was uh, a joint EU policy towards Russia uh, and uh, in order to basically survive uh, it had to be renewed as a joint policy between the four partners. Um, it was to increase security, as I mentioned, in this region. Uh, and um, it, it was uh, and has been, uh, and in our interviews it, it comes uh, up very clearly, it is still considered very much as a Finnish project uh, in the European Union, or then projects of former uh, Prime Minister Paavo Lipponen, uh, to draw uh, EU's attention to Finland uh, to, and, and to the north, uh, and that was of course in, in, uh, important uh, when Finland joined the European Union uh, in the 1990s, and to improve Finnish position in the uh, EU's uh, regional policy. And again, here we go way beyond uh, the, uh, the, the strategy uh, elements as well. The, the northern dimension partnerships are environmental partnership, uh, health and uh, social well-being, Partnership, partnership for logistics and transport, and, and culture partnership. Uh, the only that has had a big budget that has been considered as the um, uh, um, as a uh, flagship of the northern dimension is the environmental partnership with uh, big big budgets uh, uh, involving a number of uh, international banks and so on. The other ones are rather small. Uh, and deal with uh, specific issues uh, and, and networks of, of scholars, for example, and practitioners. Uh, theoretically, we could be looking at this from different perspectives. I'm not going into uh, detail, but for example, multi-level governance uh, from um, how uh, the, the um, power has been uh, changed from uh, national to supra or subnational um, uh, levels of governance to we can look at the, the uh, talk about the post Westphalian, uh, postmodern, or, or post territorial governance. Or we could also be looking um, uh, this as a multi vocal, uh, vocal uh, character, competing territorialities, uh, varying uh, frameworks, rationalities, and arguments. And, and here uh, I think this, uh, the, the, the the approach of uh, the, the local level comes uh, important. 
How do they understand the northern dimension in, in the uh, local and regional levels? What policies they actually do um, uh, when they refer to northern dimension? Um, do they uh, refer to border, uh, broader political goals of the European Union or, or the goals of the northern dimension? Um, and of course, uh, um, what we got uh, interested is about the, the possible in, um, impacts of the sanctions regimes uh, and the, 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 uh, the geopolitical situation at the moment. Alternative concepts uh, and how Russia or the European Union um, is viewed uh, within this context. We, did, uh, we have done until now for, uh, 24 interviews, uh, mainly in Helsinki, but also in uh, the city of Joensuu, uh, where we come from in North Karelia, in eastern Finland, uh, in Lapland, in, in the very north uh, of Finland, uh, in Rovaniemi, and then uh, in Oulu, in no northern Ostrobotnia. Um, uh, we will be conducting uh, more uh, interviews later. We have interviewed people in the ministries, uh, foreign affairs, uh, employment and economics, environment, transport and communications, uh, social affairs and health, so those who are responsible uh, uh, for the, the, the partnerships. Uh, and also we've interviewed some political uh, uh, key figures, uh, um, former prime minister and foreign minister, local regional actors, and, and uh, for example in the regional councils. I will not go into uh, the, the topics. But uh, what we can see is that, uh, that the concept of Northern Dimension is actually very difficult uh, to define both at the state level and um, at the, at the uh, local level. Um, most people do know the, the official uh, definition, but um, uh, what was very clear is that uh, the definition or the understanding of Northern Dimension is very different at uh, uh, the local level than, than in, in the strategies uh, or, or the, the papers of the European Union or, or the state. Um, and um, uh, usually uh, it refers to something that takes place in the North. Uh, very. Uh, fussy thing uh, in the north, something that we do with the Russian Federation. So uh, not so much talk about security or, or, or uh, sustainability, uh, sustainable development or so. There is a quote. Uh, it is what we, uh, that we cooperate with Russia, what we do in research, but also between cities and in business. That is our perspective. For us, the concept uh, was good as we were looking for uh, contacts in Russia. And suddenly the door was open also to other direction, not only to the West and the South. That time uh, we put lots of effort to that. So it was, uh, uh, when we can say that, it was a way, uh, one way uh, of breaking um, or, or uh, tackling the peripherality of, of uh, those areas. Uh, one new uh, direction that they, they could look um, beyond, uh, across the border. Um, concrete things that they talk about were, were national uh, northern dimension forums that were organized in different cities of Finland um, and also um, ways to attempt uh, uh, investments or um, EU funding or institutions of the European Union, for example, the EU Information Center on the Northern Dimension or, or uh, uh, of the no uh, Arctic. Um, in the 2000s, um, it was not clear where the Russia wa uh, Russian Federation was going. Uh, and in that sense, there were talk about um, welfare gaps, poverty, uh, health problems, uh, uh, HIV and tuberculosis, criminality, and possibly uh, immigration uh, from or through, uh, through Russia. So there was this kind of uh, security talk was there uh, and did exist, but it was not dominating at, at, at any means. Um, um, and, or, or they were not referring to the broad goals of, of the Northern Dimension or, or the European Union uh, cooperation. Um, 
in the state level, they many times talked about the long border uh, and, and uh, the possible impacts of the border, of course referring to what's going on beyond the border. Um, uh, with a big, uh, everyone saying it was a good concept, but with uh, some disappointment, the concepts um, started to fade and, and getting new forms in, in mid 2000s, and it was renewed, as I mentioned, in 2006, and it became this uh, three, uh, theme based cooperation um, uh, with um, um, no con contacts or relevance uh, at the local level. We were very surprised actually when. Uh, we found out that these partnerships um, were very distant from uh, the local level. People did not know what was going on. They had basically not heard anything uh, about uh, the partnerships, and it basically disappeared. So new concepts and ideas uh, emerged. Uh, some other um, more uh, quotes. Uh, in the beginning, the idea was that Russia would uh, be, um, be a strong partner with the European Union but it did not happen like that. I don't know where they, so the partnerships. Um, maybe it was like a cooperation between ministries, national networks. The foreign ministry talks about the partnerships, but, but not about their activities. And we in the regions uh, do not hear from uh, their activities. Uh, you have to be very active yourself and get uh, that in for yourself. Uh, it uh, did not uh, come otherwise. And, and another one. Uh, I remember we talked uh, to secretariats of the uh, partnerships uh, during the preparatory phase of the first NPCBC pro uh, program, talked about the, their views and possible uh, contents. But when we prepared the next one uh, in 2013 and 14, that possibility was not there anymore, did not come up anymore. To my ears, Northern Dimension sounds old fashioned. It is like Russia, Russian time, something like. Um, it focuses on Russian cooperation. At least here it's uh, uh, under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, not uh, in other minutes so much. Uh, as it had no funding, it has faded. Uh, maybe it has uh, disappeared under these other things, under Arctic. Now we talk about Arctic. We talk about Barents. Uh, now we talk about the Baltic Sea strategy. Um, these all, in a way, are part of the Northern Dimension, but the concept has yet faded. These macro-regional strategies come, in a way, to replace it. Um, it did not uh, fill up the expectations uh, in, in the regions, uh, uh, among the regional actors, and um, so uh, new concepts was coming up. Arctic, as, as I mentioned, was, of course, one and um, this was particularly important, of course, in, in the north, uh, in Lapland. Everyone here is, uh, everything here is uh, Arctic. Um, so, and, and uh, it was very different uh, in, in our region where um, the Finland is, is, is Arctic, um, but uh, uh, as, as our informant was saying, we cannot go to our um, uh, actors to uh, tell that we are Arctic or, or Barents. They wouldn't understand it. So in our region, it's, it's more about uh, cross-border cooperation. This is how it looks in the north. Um, it is um, uh, not only in the politics, but it has been commercialized into um, uh, beyond the strategies uh, in, into marketing, uh, into a very visible uh, elements of the city, events in the city. Um, I will um, maybe just conclude <laughs> um, by saying um, the impact of the Georgian war uh, uh, um, the Georgian war impacted directly um, the, the previous funding period, and now the uh, war in Ukraine impacts this. Uh, in, in practice, uh, the machinery of CBC program runs smoothly, and the money wa uh, wa um, was already, if, uh, as if the money was already there. 
that administration works, we have selected the projects, uh, made tenders and ad advertised programs, but no funding has been um, received. So um, uh, what has happened is that uh, the EU-Russian uh, funding ag agreement has not been um, uh, yet ratified by the Duma, but it's not about Duma. It has been uh, delayed by four years uh, by um, uh, a number of reasons. Um, and we can only speculate if that is uh, related to this wider politics. Uh, even though uh, cross-border cooperation and regional cooperation are outside sanctioned regimes. Um, Russians are very interested about the cooperation. Um, of course, now we have this uh, interruption between the uh, program periods that has had an impact. Um, also, the certain view, uh, new legislation that has been directed um, against small actors in Russia for an agent law, for example. The bigger act, uh, actors, however, have the interest to participate. They are interest, there is interest to participate uh, in Russia, but uh, the, the domestic uh, context is, is difficult. And it's not so much about international politics, uh, about in, in this context, um, but domestic politics. Could be international, of course. We don't know how the ratification, for example, goes. Thank you. Thank you, Ioni, and, and thanks for all the presentation. Maybe I invite you to, to sit here while Victor Conrad will uh, present uh, his comments, and we are then able to also answer questions after when we have a good time for discussion after this. So, James, please uh, join us here. And Victor, the, the floor is now yours. It's an interesting view from here, actually. There's this big room and uh, these little points of, uh, of uh, humanity points throughout of it. <laughs> points of light, definitely points of light. Uh, I'm Victor Conrad. I'm from Carleton University in Canada. You might wonder why I'm here uh, and in this particular panel. I, I've spent some time at the University of Finland as a, as a visiting scholar, and I've participated in a number of these discussions previously. That doesn't give me too many credentials, but uh, at least I can hopefully make some informed comments on the papers. Uh, there were uh, th three presentations, uh, as, as we know, and uh, what, uh, what James has done is to provide us with a very, very effective uh, uh, context for, uh, for this discussion, not only for this session, but for the, for the subsequent one as well. And uh, uh, I, I have uh, uh, a, a few questions. In a sense, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, re-engage with a, a number of questions that James has already provided because the answers, I think, are very important, but the answers are very elusive. And uh, uh, the first one that I, that, that I have, it relates to uh, reflective actorness. Uh, this concept, uh, I would like to hear a little bit more about reflective in the context of actorness and, 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 uh, and where you're, uh, you're getting at with that. Then, of course, there are the two leading questions that, uh, that are recurrent throughout the presentation and uh, throughout this, this, this field of inquiry, and that is, is the EU neighborhood policy still viable? And then, of course, can the EU still act with cohesiveness. I think both of these have been raised and both of these remain somewhat unanswered because uh, you know, we, we need a crystal ball to, to, to engage in that. But I'd like to hear a, a, a little bit more ab about those re recurrent questions. Then uh, with regard to the, the challenges that, uh, that you've listed, uh, the EU borders both softening and hardening uh, the efficient, uh, there's efficient border management in place, uh, 
uh, with regard to uh, several of the countries, particularly Moldova and the, and the, uh, and the Ukraine and, and Belarus, but the, the, the problem, of course, is with Russia, and, and how are we getting there uh, is, the, uh, is the question. Uh, th there's a greater access to the EU from the Eastern Partnership. Uh, we have uh, um, migration not being a problem, but the geopolitical tensions essentially taking over in this regard. And uh, again, coming back to uh, Russia as, as the big uh, challenge with regard to uh, e the EU's uh, uh, directions in, in, in the future. And this then, I think, provides a nice segue to the second presentation which focuses on uh, the economic partnership. So we've got both geopolitics on the one hand and geoeconomics on the other hand playing in this, this arena. And with regard to the, this, the second paper, uh, I would like to have a better sense of uh, this comment that you made about the trade-offs and the deals and the, the way in which this machine uh, of uh, expansion of the single market, how that proceeds. I mean, you almost get a sense of this, this overwhelming uh, juggernaut that's moving east based upon uh, the successes that it's had in, in, in other directions, particularly in the southerly direction, and how that thinking then gets transposed into a perspective for the East. Because in terms of uh, uh, your, your summation, uh, you're suggesting that the EU actorness with regard to economic expansion into the East is fraught with all sorts of problems, all sorts of difficulties that uh, were either not foreseen in the beginning or uh, were not addressed effectively in the policy uh, di directions that, uh, that, that developed. And so uh, the Ukraine it, as you point out, is the second most ambitious of the contractual frameworks. And uh, the Ukraine, on the other hand, uh, has some uh, similarities in terms of, of the, the, uh, the approach to, uh, to what we see with regard to Turkey's agreement. Uh, with what uh, we see with some of the other agreements, but uh, the fact that there's been no conciliation committee developed, the fact that there are uh, structural asymmetries that are, that are massive in, in this instance, uh, the, the sense is that the gap between approximation and, and realization becomes a very, very, very real problem. And I guess uh, what, what I would like to see is perhaps you uh, just uh, addressing uh, a little bit about how the plan went so wrong, how we find ourselves in a situation in which uh, the vision cannot be realized. Even though uh, I get a sense that the geopolitical visions that the EU has, as, as uh, outlined by James, are a lot more open-ended and amorphous than the geoeconomic uh, directions that the EU has. And, and so we're, we're caught in a situation in which uh, the geoeconomic and the geopolitical are n not aligned and they're grating against each other in the realization of uh, of the, the the vision, the uh, uh, the vision with regard to the uh, uh, the neighborhood policies. Now, uh, 
as far as uh, as the third paper is concerned, uh, Yoni's uh, presentation about the northern dimension of of the uh, local regional dynamics of, of evolving EU actorness. Here we have a theory, in a sense, that uh, that was put in, in, into uh, effect in the uh, in the halcyon days of, of the, the, the European Union, uh, the tremendous uh, expansion going on, and, uh, and the uh, participation of, of Finland in, in trying to uh, establish a dimension that, uh, that, would, uh, that would serve its purposes at the same time that it would align with the, with the EU's uh, general plans for redevelopment. And uh, I, I'm kind of interested in this notion that you've underlined and it clearly uh, that you are questioning as well, and that is this sense of equal partners. On the one hand, yes, they are equal partners because there's a very careful uh, development of this policy which doesn't allow for uh, inequalities to be emphasized. Yet, on the other hand, are they really equal partners or was the northern dimension uh, just a, a dream in a sense uh, that uh, that really didn't lead to any kind of realization. We know that in effect it wasn't realized to the degree that that they wanted it to be. But yet, you know, uh, what does equality really mean in in in, in this uh, sense? And that, of course, raises the question of metrics. Were there any metrics established for the assessment of uh, the success of uh, first of all the uh, the elements of sustainability, well-being, uh, stability that that you've uh, you've, you've brought forward, uh, and uh, you didn't talk about metrics there, but I'm just curious as to whether there were any of those. Um, the importance of locality and the importance of subnational uh, governments and subnational entities in in the uh, development of this, uh, this policy is, is very uh, promising in a sense at, at first because it, it does provide access to many of the localities and if, if any of you have ever been in, in this part of the world, you know how important, loca uh, important locality is because that's what you, you have in many instances, these, uh, these disparate localities that are, are uh, 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 not visibly connected in, 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 in many ways. So uh, the north and this northern dimension then begins to fade, as you've pointed out, and it's been replaced in, in various ways. And I, uh, I'd, I'd like you to perhaps just comment on uh, the replacement uh, with this concept, this even more amorphous concept of Arctic. You know, how does Arctic really uh, enable us? And then there, there's, of course, uh, the, the relationship with the Arctic Council, perhaps, and a number of these other institutional frameworks that have actually uh, had their formulation outside of the EU and, and how, they, how the EU uh, conception fits in with that. Um, anyway, I, uh, I enjoyed all three of these presentations and uh, hopefully uh, these uh, questions and comments will lead uh, to further discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Um, our time is uh, running out, not fast, but uh, uh, I still think it's a good idea to include also the audience uh, at this point. So if there are immediate uh, questions or, or comments at my, uh, in your minds, I, I would uh, gather a couple of, of questions and, uh, at this point already. Uh, or while we all are gathering our thoughts, uh, Let's uh, give the panelists first the word. So, James. Oh, okay. 
I'll try to be as concise uh, as possible. Thanks, uh, Victor, for, for those comments, and, and thanks for um, the, com the, the observation that I really didn't talk too much about what I meant by reflected geopolitics. I, it was implied but not explicitly mentioned. And what did I mean? A mistake. I should have been more to the point. Um, and it's really about the identity of the, G uh, of the European Union and the fact that, of course, if you were to kind of completely remodel and question the European neighborhood policy and also the values, the ideas that lie behind it, you would have an identity crisis because you would have basically destroy the ideational foundation that gives some kind of a cohesion to EU action. So the ontological security of the EU would be threatened because it would not have, it would know where it would, would not know where it would be in relation to other actors. And the EU of course holds to its ENP and is rather resistant to change in the ENP for exactly this reason. It wants to maintain that core of ideas and, and processes and uh, routines that, have, that, that it has maintained in order just to, to maintain that sense that we know what we're doing when we operate. So this is a very important aspect. And this, the problem with this, I understand having you know, the, the need for uh, strengthening or, or, or defending the identity of the EU is there among the EU elites, but it also leads into the problem of self-referential thinking, the trap of self-referentiality. And the only way out of that is to be reflective about what you're doing. Where can you learn? How can you see what you're doing is where it is actually providing something positive and where is it leading to a situation of, of real conflict uh, in terms of uh, values, in terms of uh, because of as asymmetric uh, political pressure, because of uh, perceptions, etc. And this is, I think, an area where the European Union could really improve a lot, it's, it's actorness. And I do think that the ENP is an important uh, instrument. Um, it could be a very viable instrument, but as Alexander said, if it really is reduced to this kind of criteriology, this bureaucratic kind of, uh, you know, uh, um, and very, very power asymmetric kind of relationship where, you know, you, d you sign this, and if you want to get anything from us or you're not in, this is not the way it really, I, I don't think it can, can, can pr properly work. That is a problem. And the qu question is how do you negotiate that, 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 that flexibility in the, in the neighborhood policy? One, you, you, you do need structure. You do need a certain degree of, you know, uh, of agreement between partners and some, 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 regu you know, some rules. But at the same time, you have to also be open to different situations, contextual uh, situations. Um, that o offer the partners more leeway, and I'm including the EU in here. And I think that the, what, what Yoni was talking about in the Northern Dimension is it offers a space, a potential space of cooperation that is depoliticized and pragmatic. It's not, a, it's not a, uh, an absolute solution to all of the problems that the EU has in, 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 in interacting in, in, in terms of its very ambitious, noble values, but it's perhaps uh, a, a, a potential for, for the future. So yes, I, I think that's how I would put this together. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for two very interesting questions. They are really very, I mean, it's not easy to respond on them in sort of in a very concise manner, but I will try. Uh, again, in order to understand what the EU is and what it is not, we have to you know, imagine the political map we have today and what we had at the late of 70s. And the changes and what changed on the map, what is new, it's thanks to the EU. It's not because of the, I would say, you know, primarily political will, because still it looks like that there are national perspectives on foreign policy and even the Lisbon Treaty, which is, you know, valid since the 2009, uh, so says that when it comes to the relations with the third countries, there should be consensus. And it's very difficult to find a political consensus when it comes to the external relations. Otherwise, inside the common market, and this is the core of the EU integration, you know, the, the, the project, how it expanded, how it evolved. Now it's, you know, we decide with the qualified majority. We have two formulas. I'm not going to go into details, but 
This is a unique project. We never had something like that in the history of international relations, that still 28 or 27 countries managed to agree on some, you know, how we produce common legislation, because European integration means that we share common legislation. If we can produce common legislation, we are integrated. If we will st uh, stop the, uh, to have this capacity to produce common, that is the end of the European Union and uh, end of the project. This is the Roma Empire heritage, you know, it's very legalistic project, but it cannot be different. The EU cannot perform, you know, vis-a-vis -vis third countries just as it is from inside. And that means expand and invite other members to the club. But look, so we already agreed you have to join if you want to join, because it's not the EU who is pressing the neighbors to become members, it's the members pressing the EU, open the door, we want to become the members, you know. And here's the question about the Russia. Because in Ukraine, 2014, it happens for the first time over the last 400 years that third country tries to stop this process which worked well for decades, you know, and it delivered to the Southern Europe, it delivered to the Western Balkans, it delivered, you, we have different countries now, and this thanks to the European integration. So this is the value of the European integration. Without that, we wouldn't have it. But this is also how it works, you know, as, as an actor. And yes, we are in conflict with Russia, because this, it's not Russian-Ukrainian conflict, it's conflict about the future of European integration process based on the rules developed within the European Union. The problem is that Russia, over the two decades, was not able to offer sort of the constructive, uh, you know, uh, agenda to neighbors. And we had the gas wars and conflicts. And again, you know, how it happened that we are, how we got, because this was the second question, how we got to this situation, you know, it was after uh, military intervention of Russia in Georgia, August 2008. First September, Nicolas Sarkozy, France, uh, uh, France was the presidency uh, council country at that time. There was extra extraordinary meeting of the uh, heads of the governments, and they were thinking how we will respond. Russian tanks, you know, in Georgia, what we can do, what we are actor. One of the, there was conclusions, the nine points, one of them, mandate to the European Commission to prepare ambitious offer. And I interviewed those authors of the e European Commission communication adopted in December 2008, after the summit, when they included, you know, this DCFTA component into the association agreement, which made it equal to those integrative types of agreements starting from Norway, Iceland, Italy, Switzerland, Turkey, etc. So this was the response that this CFT component is a part of the Eastern Partnership Agreements because of the decision of the leaders of the European Union 1st September that this is a response to Russian tanks to, 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 to Georgia. If it would not happen, I'm sure there will be nothing like that. Maybe Poland, uh, Sweden, they will, would lobby, look, include that, but I do not think they will be successful. But there was, uh, if you want, a reflective actor. This is a, Exactly, I mean, a good case to show that they how reflective the EU is. But it has instruments and tools, it's moving within, you know, so it cannot behave different way. Uh, thank you. I don't think I have time for all of the questions, but, but uh, this uh, question of uh, equality is quite interesting and quite uh, very important. Uh, the, the process leading to the renewal of the Northern Dimension in 2006 was uh, r related to this idea of equality and Russia was uh, considered uh, of not um, being rather ob object than a subject and, and an actor in, in, in the Northern Dimension. And, and uh, what um, uh, James just mentioned is that um, what became the result is that very, this very pragmatic cooperation within the partnerships, uh, cooperation uh, between uh, experts, um, uh, Russia putting th its own money, for example, in the environmental uh, projects, um, uh, and quite a lot of money, so it is it, it involved in it, it itself uh, in these projects. Um, and um, um, 
uh, if you look at the uh, projects, it was quite interesting to see that those projects that have been decided, for example, in the uh, CBC Karelia uh, program, that have not received funding because of the, the problems uh, yet, uh, hopefully soon, um, over half of the projects uh, are at the uh, in these um, these um, last rounds are um, uh, administered by Russian uh, colleagues. Um, uh, so in that sense, at least in this uh, project level, um, uh, it has been developing a lot. Um, the, this, this, of course, this uh, long period of uh, no projects uh, leads uh, into a number of problems, uh, for example, in, in the cap capabilities of, of the actors to uh, to uh, build up and run projects. Uh, the, the people change, and if you don't have the continuity, it, it, it means that um, you have to start learning uh, again and again, and especially in Russian case where uh, there's big change of uh, personnel, this, this is a problem. But I still, at least, uh, it seems that they have uh, tackled this problem. I don't know about the Finnish side, but at least. Yeah, thank you. I think we are running over time now, so uh, I just ask you to join me to thank all the presentations and our commentators. Thank you.